My name's Craig St. Denis and I live here in Toronto. A lot of people tend to forget that Canada is just the youngest nation here on Turtle Island. A lot of people also tend to forget that in the early stages of Canada between 1867 and 1885, in the first nations in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. History is a very boring subject, I know, and it's dry. But that's the truth of it. They took those first nations in. In an effort to kill the Indians and the child, you saved the men. Well, you see, I come from those last governments of Louis Riel. And I'm proof of the genetics that you're getting for. You see, they thought they could breed us out. But I'm red at heart. red at heart. Every child matters. Search them landfills. There's no pride in genocide. And you see, I've been getting into the geography too. You see, we've got a sea here in Canada, it's called the Arctic Sea. And we've got a river, it's called the Red River. So when I say, from the river to the sea, Palestine and Turtle Island will be free.
nervous. Can everybody close their eyes? <laughs> I'm just gonna picture you all naked. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, my name is Benisi. Um, my uh, government name is Adina. And um, I'm an Indian residential school survivor. I was an Indian residential school from when I was five years old until I was 13. I am a genocidal survivor. I'm a fifth intergenerational residential school survivor. I was in residential school. My brother was in residential school. My mother was in residential school. My grandmother and my great grandmother. And we were in the Muskaugan Indian residential school. And all of us still lived. But my mom isn't here. One of my brothers passed away in there, unfortunately. And that's due to colonial genocide. That's due to ethnic cleansing. We, as First Nation, are the true sovereign royalty to this land that you stand on. This is First Nation land. So, when I came out of that Indian residential school, I came out a very angry teen. I remember all too frequently. I still get flashbacks. Uh, I, ha I suffer with post-traumatic stress disorder, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. From the age of five until I was 13, I was brutalized in there in every way that you can think. What five-year-old child should, should you know, where their innocence was taken as a little girl, you know, by, by grown men and grown women. And I'm not the only one that suffered. There were so much other little boys and girls, you know, that perished in those schools. I was one of the survivors. I am a failed Indian residential school survivor. I am a matriarch. Oh, I'm just shaking. Yeah. Yeah. I was having a panic attack before I came here. You know, um, because I know I had to speak on my traumas as a child. You know, and my, my kids suffered you know, um, from parenting skills that I didn't have. You know, my kids were, were traumatized as well as little boys and little girls. You know, because in that time when they needed me most, you know, the most crucial times in their life, I wasn't the mother that I could have been due to intergenerational trauma and trauma. You know, I now stand with my little son who's here somewhere, my little Bucky. You know, he's a little warrior too. You know, he's kind of misunderstood, but he has a good heart. You know, I have two daughters that are in prison, that are in prison for murder. They were involved with um, the gang life, um, crystal meth, you know, drugs. They were also part of the Millennium Scoop. They were taken from me you know, as a young mother here in Toronto. And through that system, they were human sex trafficked, you know. So right now, they sit, they sit behind Grand Valley Institute, maximum security prison walls, and Edmonton Max security prison walls. They too are little matriarchs in the making. They're warriors, they're advocates for women and men indigenous that sit behind prison walls. My daughter's name is Sharice Justice Rain, Sutherland KCS. My daughter's Katrina, Shailen Katrina, Sutherland KCS. And they advocate for women, specifically, that sit behind those walls. They, they sit on hunger strikes. They have fasts. They've been fasting and hunger striking for the Palestinian movement. Because they say, Mom, those are our relations. Those are our brothers and our sisters, our cousins. They are inter interconnected. What they are going through now 
is what we went through. They will survive just like us, but we have to stand strong and fiercely in solidarity of the indigenous people of our land. I'm just gonna have some beach. Um, I don't know what I don't know what else to say. I did have a speech, uh, but I kind of found it Tony. Did my red makeup go off my face? <laughs> um, I don't know what else to say. When time comes, as we're walking and when we make our stops. Here and there, I will say a few words here and there. I just wanted to really thank you all. You know, I honor you all for coming here and standing in solidarity with us. You all are warriors. You all are revolutionaries. You all are people that are gonna set our freedom for the people. You are the ones that are gonna liberate us from the oppressive hands of these diabolical corporate entities <laughs> and their minions, the Toronto City Police. Shame on you! Shame! Shame! So that's all I have to say for now. I don't know. Uh, Coco will be up here. <laughs> I'm shaking. Thank you again. Um, our next speaker, um, I am so sorry if I mispronounced the name. Okay, never mind, we're gonna do that different stuff. Okay. I've been doing activism for quite a long, quite a long time. And I've come to the conclusion. Land back. Land back. Why are we speaking reconciliation? How can you reconciliate with your abuser? How do you reconciliate with your abuser? You can't. The real story, the real story, get it from Benici. Get it from people like myself. Get it from the elders. And hear the truth of economic genocide. You do economic genocide, you will create cultural genocide. It's about the removal of a people off the land so that they can have access to the mineral, the trees, the water, the gold, the oil. Economic genocide will create cultural genocide and it's still happening today. Whether it be grassy narrows, Nova Scotia fishing dispute. <laughs> Missing murdered Native women. <laughs> Boiled water advisory. <laughs> KK Canada belongs in international criminal court. <laughs> and United Nations. Canada, KKK Canada, shows a pattern of criminal behavior towards First Nations. Ever since contact, all it has been is take, take, take. So what we and you people like myself and others have been listening to is 
the propaganda machine. The propaganda machine that says First Nations are very well taken care of. So if we're, if we're well taken care of, how come we're, st we're still under the water boil advisory? And how come missing murdered Native women's cases still go uninvestigated? My mother was murdered, and I tried to tell everybody about it. I told lawyers, I told police, I told media, and I probably told you. And you know what? Nothing was done about it. And you know why? Because Indian pain is big business. You're going to need hospitals. You're going to need lawyers. You're going to need jail guards. You're going to need prisons. You're going to need hospitals. You're going to need a whole lot of things for Indian pain. This is why we're here today. Indian pain, man. This is what it looks like. And you know what? They're not scared of First Nations. Who they're scared of is our allies and our brothers and sisters that are with us here today. A big shout out to our allies and supporters. Miigwech, miigwech on behalf of First Nations people across Turtle Island. Miigwech. Thousand people, and that continues 
because of the role external actors, including Canadian companies, have played in sustaining it to protect their interests. On one side of the war in Sudan, we have the Rapid Support Forces, responsible for the genocide in Darfur that began 20 years ago, whose leaders control much of the illicit gold trade in the country, which gets funneled through the gold markets of the UAE and sold to Russia and other countries. The UAE provides critical military support to the RSF as it extracts our gold. On the other hand, we have the Sudanese army and its allied Islamists, led by General Burhan, who has close ties to Egypt's Sisi. The army controls almost 70% of Sudan's economy and used this wealth to construct a repressive police state that was backed by Gulf financing. The Saudis and Emiratis have paid Sudanese military elites $27 billion over the last 20 years to steal our land. This is why there is a famine. To them, we say we want our land back. There are Canadian companies implicated as well. The RSF paid Montreal-based PR company Dickens and Madsen, headed by an Israeli intelligence officer, millions to clean up their image after it committed a massacre against revolutionaries in 2019. There are Canadian weapons manufacturing companies providing components for some of the explosive devices that have killed my own loved ones. In October of 2021, after the RSF and Army staged the coup to crush the revolution, the Canadian company Orca Gold, recently bought up by an Australian company, signed a multi-million dollar deal to exploit oil and gold with the same war criminals now waging this war. I was just in Denende, in, in the Northwest, for a solidarity gathering. Some of the same mining companies that were fueling state violence in parts of Africa are now exploiting indigenous land and labor and contaminating vital water sources in Denende. The companies claim that extracting minerals like diamonds, cobalt, coltan and gold in indigenous territories makes them no longer conflict minerals. But what could be more violent than extracting minerals and contaminating soil and water from stolen indigenous lands that the Canadian state refuses to give back? This is how indigenous self-determination in North America and the global struggle to demilitarize and, ab and abolish the cops is tied to the struggle for a liberated Sudan and Congo. From Darfur to Turtle Island, these are not just conflict minerals, they are genocide minerals. The RSF received 200 million from the European Union in 2014 to stop the migration of East Africans into Europe. Egyptian authorities are now using EU funded security forces to deport Sudanese refugees. This, this is the deadly violence of borders and border regimes that we must abolish. The war in Sudan has produced the largest internal displacement crisis in the world. Over 10 million people have been forced to flee their homes. The Canadian state initiated a visa to allow Sudanese refugees to reunite with their Canadian citizen relatives, but capped it at 3,250. Its financial and bureaucratic requirements make eligibility almost impossible, and the process is so long that the first Sudanese person receiving this visa is arriving in 2025. This amounts to a ban on Sudanese refugees who do not have family in Canada. And we call out the Canadian government's hypocrisy for instituting a refugee ban on stolen land. There have been no free expedited visas issued for Sudanese refugees in Canada or elsewhere, even though the blueprint for these visa programs exists for Europeans fleeing war. Beyond anti-black racism, this is about the ways Canadian corporations are profiting from genocide, from Darfur to Palestine to the Congo to Turtle Island. This is why we call for an end to Canada's deadly profit making and complicity in genocide. We say hands off Sudan and Congo and land back. Free the land from Turtle Island to Sudan. Free the people. Speaker, uh, 
badass Native woman, Nancy Rukmis. I'm speaking in my language, introducing myself. My name is Manisha Kave. I'm from Thunder Bay. I'm here for the orange t-shirt and I'm here for everything. I'm here for the land. I wanted to say something about this. Um, I did the um, march the first few days and I heard some stuff that uh, really bothered me. And uh, I just want to say, if people are unhappy being in, in Canada or, or this land, maybe they shouldn't be here. Because what I heard when I was marching, I didn't like it and I'm not going to repeat it. It was just that it really bothered me. And if people are unhappy in this indigenous land, then maybe you shouldn't be here. And that's what I say because this is the land my grandmother raised me. Not in Toronto, but somewhere in Thunder Bay area after I was born. And my grandmother raised me right to, the, to my adulthood. Then she left me and I do all the work now because she wanted me to grow up and become something, not become something, but to, to fight for the land that we have. And it's for the children. We have to save the children. The children's going to take over the land we give them that they're raised on. They're going to take over our lives and take care of us and they're going to keep on moving. I am always for the kids and the children. And I fight for uh, youth also. Youth walks with me all over wherever I go. And I really like them because they give me that um, power to kind of talk a little bit about what's going on. I do not like what people do to each other either. And um, if you're, well, I follow my, I follow the seventh generation, which I added eight. I did some teaching about the eight, eight fire. Yes. Yes. It's about the Canada goose who traveled back and forth to Canada to wherever they come from. And what, the, what in my mind they said was, I am Canada goose. I come back and forth. We come here to help. We come here to die. We come here to feed. Feed the First Nation. That's the way it was from the beginning. And we survived and they keep on coming and they keep on going. That's why I like the Canada Goose as to represent my life. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> but uh, and Canada Goose is about forgiveness. There are seven teachings. I added one more, which becomes eight teaching. And that's Canada Goose, forgiveness. I love everybody, it doesn't matter what happens. I just love everybody, I'm a loving kind of person. And anything can go on, I'll just keep on loving, but I'll keep on fighting too. There's both things I can do. And I am here to follow you people, to walk with you, to love you guys, to be to be the people for the babies, the orange t-shirt babies. We need them. We have to fight for them. We have to stand for them. We have to teach them. We have to teach them to love themselves. If you can't love yourself, then you can't teach nobody. It doesn't work. That's all I have to say. And thank you very much for allowing me to speak here. I am here for the youth. Wherever you are, follow me and we'll go places.
I'm two spirited, happy, and happy every fucking day. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the four directions, the four sacred medicines, our higher power that created a great mystery, and all the little children that never made it home. We want to acknowledge them little ones on these lands that still have to be found too. Shame on fucking Canada. I'm a product of the residential school in Muscatine, so I was there two years and I was spooked. That's when I started losing my, um, my Cree language, Plains Cree. I spoke it fluently before I was spooked. And uh, <clears throat> so anyways, as time went on, I end up on the streets of Old West. And if you've been out to Alberta and BC, you know, you haven't seen racism unless you've been on the lands. And uh, Saskatchewan is another province that's very racist against indigenous people. You know, I'm an Indian woman. I was an Indian girl. And I was told I was an Indian. I will always be an Indian. I'm not Aboriginal, I'm not Indigenous, I'm not First Nations, I'm not First People. I've always fucking been here. So, remember that. You're not First People, you're not First, you've always been here. You never left. We never left. Remember, we're all spirits, first and foremost, before that vessel that you carry. When you go to home on that western doorway, you leave that vessel here, that shell that's on low, while you're on this physical world. You don't take it with you. You take your spirit, because you gain the spirit, and you need the spirit, 24-7. You know, and, and these are old, old teachings that's been passed on to us from many, many generations ago, not something that I Googled on Google. I'm not a commercialized Indian or a tokenized Indian. You can't buy me. Look at all what the money has done to your fucking land right here in Toronto. Look at all these high buildings for what? Look at all the uh, homeless, the houseless people right here on your streets. Shame on Trudeau, shame on Ford. Shame! If I had my way, you know what? I would fucking turn him over my knees and spank him hard. <laughs> you know, I like insulting these politicians, eh? Because it's the politicians that are corrupted, not us. Not the criminals are in prison. You know, right now. Go to Iraq. Listen, I'm going to keep talking to my, um, she's worried about a streetcar. Well, the streetcar will run if you just give us some time. I don't have to move. You're on my land. Keep going. 
keep moving forward, push back harder. They push, we push back harder! Search Landfills, MMIW, Two Spirit, Trans, also Every Child Matters. Every person matters if you have a cold and heart like we do. I just want to acknowledge the little people that are here with us and are walking with us. They are our future generation and all the young people. You're our seven generations forward, and then seven generations forward after that. We have to learn from the seven generations from behind us in order to move forward for the next seven generations. Who gives a fuck what's gonna happen in 14 years? Think about what's gonna happen tomorrow. Don't be sleeping on a job. Don't sleep on a job. Because you know what? They are trying to steal more land sell land that doesn't even fucking belong to them. Israel sucks big dicks. I don't talk about that normally, but you know what? I, I, I oppose people that kill innocent people, innocent children, innocent women, elders, people, defenseless people. Shame on Israel. Free Palestine. Free America. We are free. We will always be free because we are still fucking here. Okay, okay, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna move this up a little bit, eh? But you know what? I couldn't share a little more, but I don't wanna bore you with my uh intoxicated life, I was smoking some good cannabis. Smoke weed. Never say no to weed. Yeah, so I'm smoking. Look at, look at all this, eh? You got, you got, you got going on here. We block every fucking intersection. Wow, good for you, man. This is what I call and participated in a delegation of Palestinians to Treaty 3 organized by Anishinaabe Palestine Resistance. We are so grateful for our indigenous sisters and kin for making space for us. Indigenous communities, we have witnessed worlds end over and over again. As the settler colonial entities of Canada and Israel are attempting to annihilate our people, poison our communities, and devise our lands and waters, we, re Shame. we recognize that our work together is not new. It is vital now more than ever as we witness continued climate catastrophes and multiple genocides worldwide. Our resistance is rooted in the plight of our ancestors. We must honor their efforts and build on their joint resistance. We remember that during the Kanastaki resistance in the 1990s, Mohawk land defenders learned from the First Intifada. We know that Palestinian activists were among allies at the 78-day blockade to resist Canadian government-sanctioned land theft and dispossession. <laughs> Members of AIM visited with Palestinian resistance leaders in Beirut in the 1970s and were also present to support Anishinaabe land defenders who occupied Anishinaabe Park 15 years ago. <laughs> 
this month, the three of us witnessed the continuation of this profound legacy. We participated in a Palestinian delegation to Treaty 3, organized by the Anishinaabe Palestinian Alliance and our Anishinaabe relatives, Tiana and Quill. We participated in ceremonies, connected with elders and knowledge keepers, and learned about resistance in Treaty 3. Importantly, we deepened our relationships with each other as Palestinian and Anishinaabe and with the ancestral lands of our Anishinaabe kin. I just have a very quick, very important announcement. So while we were not all able to get to the water, there was a grandmother with her big long stick and her medicine and a little group made it to the waterfront to do a ceremony today. They went right how you should have seen it. It was like watching the queen walk. Well, not the queen there, but you know what I mean. Like walking. She went for it. that we learned during our delegation. Firstly, we learned our indigenous and Palestinian solidarity work must be rooted in relationships. Land back is rooted in our rightful relationships to lands and waters. In coming together as we built a sweat lodge at Manitou Rapids and visited Judy Da Silva at Gresty Narrows, we held one another's grief in ways we have not been able to in the past nine months and engaged in collective world making. Our constellating experiences, struggles, and hopes for the future inform the way that we come together, not if we come together. This work is not easy, and at times it's messy and it's frustrating, but that's also what made us so raw and so real. Our relationship building helps us to recognize the way pieces of ourselves and our communities and our lands and our waters live inside one another. We are so grateful for our Anishinaabe kin for bringing us closer to Palestine. <laughs> We also recognize how the health of our peoples is inextricably tied to the health of our lands. Health is also embodied and deeply grounded in the spiritual. The delegation met with leaders and fasters of the longest running logging bl blockade to protect some of the last clean waters at Grassy Narrows. Mercury poisoning of sacred waters from upstream paper mills continues to poison and affect our Anishinaabe kin and communities. Shame! Shame. Shame. We also learned about the, uh, the occupation of Anishinaabe Park, which was also directly related to issues around health and police violence. Shame! Shame. Shame. The occupation also centered Medewin ceremony as a commitment to ground their organizing in the ways of their people. For Anishinaabe, ceremony and spiritual and spirit are vital material lifelines. We had the honor of witnessing Medewin ceremony and listening to the creation stories from elders on our first day, which set forth our own commitment to healing. We affirm that healing ourselves, our lands, and our communities is a necessity in our collective struggle toward land back and right of return. And then next, we remembered the children, our future. Settler colonial states in their cowardice target our children as an attack on our futures. When so-called Canada stole and continues to steal indigenous children from their families and homelands through residential schools which became the 60s scoop and now the millennial scoop, this is an attack on indigenous futures. In Gaza, shame! In Gaza, where over 14,000 children have been killed! 17,000! 17,000 are believed to be unaccompanied and another 4,000 are missing, likely under the rubble. And while schools and hospitals continue to be targeted, this is an attack on Palestinian futures. Shame. Shame. 
One of our biggest guides and teachers was a three-year-old Anishinaabeg child, raised in her ways and deeply attuned to creation. She showed us what was missing within ourselves. We affirmed that the, re the resistance also means creating better worlds for our children to grow up in. Rooted in our cultures, identities, and the land, may we continue to dream for freedom for our children. It is no doubt that Treaty 3 brought us closer to Palestine, witnessing our kin know their homelands intimately and be embraced in return by all of creation. We found ourselves as Palestinians who yearn to step foot on Palestine's soil feel closer to her than ever before. We exchanged Arabic and Anishinaabe Moan words with no hesitation. We sang prisoner songs to the river at Grassy Narrows. We prayed together. We cried together. We cooked together. <laughs> and when in doubt, we threw salt out on everything that we cooked. <laughs> <laughs> and we asked questions about liberation. Only the spirits in our ancestors meeting in Treaty 3 could guide us through. We received signs from bears, from pelicans, eagles, turtles, the water, thunderbirds, and even tornadoes that, were, that, that we knew that we were doing exactly what we were meant to be doing. Reaching toward each other, building bonds across lifetimes, centering the land, the children, the spirits, and everything that we do. We know that our colonizers attack most what they fear and do not understand. We know that our relationships is in a realm beyond what these pigs could ever understand. <laughs> our relationships for that reason are one of our most powerful weapons. Relationships are often all that we have and deepening our connections to each other, to the land, and to spirit is the work of world building. It is land back. Let me say that again, it is land back. It is the right of return. It is the right of return. It is knowing with our deepest conviction that nothing is ever truly lost. No mortar, no child, no ceremony, no song, no story is ever truly lost. That there will be a day where we know the land, our stories, our languages with no hesitation. That once this world ends, the only rubble left will be that of empire. And we will have planted the seeds to build anew. Our stories will continue to be alive and imbued with spirit. Our children will no longer have to write with their blood. Instead, the children will outlast these settler colonial states and these pigs over here. They will outlive them. They will rewrite the meaning of this world with their living. Glory to our martyrs, to our children, to our grandparents, to our land, to our water. Thank you. And we always make our way to the water with no problems. And they told me not twice, but four times, the reason we cannot go to the water is because Palestinians are walking with us. Shame on you colonizers. This is not your land. You don't belong here.
We've always done this walk, this healing and water walk, and this rally. And we're always going to the water. But this time, we are not allowed to go to the water. And this healing and water walk. And you know why that is? Because we have our fellow brother and sister Palestinians walking around. with 
the run and the glow and the skip and the stand. Be easy, because I will continue this fight for my indigenous rights. And now I dedicate this to the Palestinians, to the Palestinian government. Keep standing in your power and in your love. And walk with your strength and don't give up this fight. knows a million billion songs is going to grace us with his beautiful voice and we're going to give it why don't it's hot and we're going to give it all our effort for one last song how does that sound <laughs> like a fucking dog <laughs> not like a four-legged dog anyways she's a woman shame on her you know, one thing I know, I understand as an Indian woman, it's our responsibility as human beings to take care of this water. Why do we have contamination in the water all over Canada, all over the world? Why is there blood going into the ocean, into the waters? Blood. Blood of, of Gaza. The blood of the 215 children that were found in Kamloops, BC. We have to understand the families that are going through that grieving process right now. You never get over that shit. Time, yeah, time goes on, but you never ever get over it. So anybody that tells me get over it, you get over it. Because you know what, unless you understand what it feels like to be in a residential school, you can't even think to even speak about it. Unless you've been walking in my shoes for 66 years. And you know what, it's a system that's fucked up. It's not the people, it's the system. Your system sucks. I don't vote because I don't believe in the white man's politics. Where has it gotten you? Really? Right now, where has it gotten you? Voting. It doesn't matter if you vote for a conservative, liberal, NDP, fucking Green Party, whatever. They're all the fucking same. They all have two parties together. Shame on them fuckers. One thing that really matters for myself is your life matters to me. And you know what? I love you. I love you even if I have never met you, but we know each other. Because you know what? It's the fucking heart, the heartbeat of the people that creates that good energy force called unconditional love. We have to be more kinder, more resilient, and more resistant. Resistance is the only way we can create that change. If we bow every time the government says jump, we say, how fucking I fuck you. We're not on the same side. We are not the same. You know, one thing, I abide by law. But I abide by the natural law, the great law of peace. If you don't understand the great law of peace, the two want them, then you don't understand this turtle, what we are on Treaty 13 territory. You give thanks for the land that you're on. Because our ancestors walked through here. They suffered. They were killed. Our women were raped, our children were tortured, killed, massacred, and that started right from Pine Ridge, South Dakota. 
You remember the old five crisis? Yeah. Old five crisis. Remember old five? So that was resistance. I give my, you know, props to Ellen Gabriel. She was one. She's a powerful, you know, Mohawk woman that stands up for the land and that water. Just like the tiny house warriors in the West Coast and West Sweden, they're still defending the land, fighting for the land. What are we fucking doing? Just blocking streets. We should be there supporting the cause. So, Sir Cilantros. You know what, for what they're going through, I've never met so kinder, generous people that's going through what they're going through. I love them all. Joe Monroe, Trey, you know all of them, George, Melissa, Robinson, all them warriors that are there. They're still holding that space, and they're doing a the good work. You don't really know how you feel until you step into that land. Imagine it was your sister, your daughter, your relative that's controlled like fucking garbage in that fucking landfill right here in Toronto. How would you feel? They're all beautiful young women. Indigenous women, Indian women. That had a whole life ahead of them. Because they were the wrong fucking color. So this white fucking bastard is going up on murder charges. But he's trying to plead insanity. But you know what? We got our justice system inside. I know the prison system. Welcome to my world. Remember Picton Farmer? Well, there's going to be another one going down for the camp. Because that's what you call payback. Because the government, the law system don't care about us. So we have to take the law into our own fucking hands. The pedophiles, your teachers that could be petties, your fucking politicians, your yes. fucking mayors, whoever, police, RCMP, you're all fucking, a lot of them are so fucking corrupted, they should be locked up. Well, you know what? I'm mean, there, that's all I got to say for now. But I, just on the end. We want to win at the same. So we're going to continue walking. I don't know my direction. North. North. <laughs> north. We're going to keep walking north. Yeah. And then just keep walking. Let's go. There's a message that you have to give the people. And it's about liberation. It's about liberating ourselves individually in every way possible, in the most genuine way. And that means even though we stand here together, Waniska, 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 that means wake up. There's a lot of people that are, are like the walking dead. We have to liberate ourselves first 
and foremost as an individual, then that will liberate our families and then our communities. We are revolutionaries. We are freedom fighters. We are the people. The police works for us. We are the ones that pay them. And to not allow us to go to the water because of who we stand in solidarity with. It really hurts me that the police, they told me the reason why we can't go to the water was because we are walking with the Palestinians. Does their lives not matter? Does their lives not matter? First and foremost, their lives should matter. First and foremost. Because right now, there is a genocidal massacre that is happening across the sea. There's children, men, women, grandmothers, grandfathers, sisters that are being massacred on the daily. They, those are human lives. You know, and for the police, those ones behind those riot gear, with those, with those horses, to put, bring horses, to colonize them, to bring genocidal violence to peaceful people that are walking for their right to live, for their people's right to live. You know, for water, for land, for the trees for children, how dare they? We will be back and we will come in numbers. And to the Toronto City Police, you need to wake up too. And to those ones, those marginalized ones that are wearing that uniform, shame on you. You should be standing here with us. Yeah, everybody, they're all sellouts, you know? And that Olivia Chow, how dare she go walk in the pride, saying she's for love and life. Meanwhile, she's complicit in a genocide. And the reason why we invited the Palestinians, because we're interconnected. What happened here so many years ago, is happening today in Palestine. They tried to annihilate the First Nation people off of land that they were gifted to, land that you around here are standing on, Northern Turtle Island. We are the First Nations. We are the Métis. We are the Inuit. We are the sovereignty, which means royalty. Land back! Land back. People need to stop being so complicit in the murder of children and their parents and their grandmothers and their grandfathers. You know what's happening in Palestine? It's sad. A lot of people here that have their children, you make sure you go home tonight and you hug your children because once they try and finish with Palestine. Where are they coming next? A lot of people, a lot of settlers, they come here to this land for safety, for harmony, you know, to rebuild their lives. That's why I welcome, as a First Nation matriarch, as a First Nation Indian residential school survivors, for the Palestinians to walk with us because we are interconnected with them. People need to open your eyes. You need to wake up because once they're finished with Palestine, where are they gonna go next? And then after that, where will they go next? How many children, how many mothers, fathers, grandparents have to die? before we all stand up as the people of this world. Land back! Land back! Every child, mind, body, soul, and spirit.
because they are true warriors. They continue on a daily to fight for those people across the sea. You people need to wake up and you need to, you need to recognize, you know, you would be homeless if the First Nation people didn't allow you here. You know, you guys think a lot of us First Nation people don't work, don't do anything. I'll tell you one thing. I'm a business owner. I have three businesses. I put myself through school. I paid for everything. I had my savings and I put myself through school. I have a small moving business. I have a catering company. I have a healing company. And I'm First Nation. And I'm an Indian residential school survivor. You know, a lot of people, a lot of, I don't like to say immigrants because it's so colonial. We as First Nation don't say immigrants. We say our relations, our brothers and our sisters. You know, relations to Canada. You know, um, <coughs> I just lost train of thought because the guy put up his hand. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I'm tired, you know. I'm tired, I go home and I cry. I honestly cry, you know, because I, I watch those, what happens across the sea. You know, and those little children, you know, they, they just want to live. You know, they have a right to live. And this is one of the reasons that I wanted this walk, is for us to come together in a good way with um, marginalized people, with um, people that were ethnically cleansed. Being an Indian residential school survivor, you know, I had, um, my mother was, Indian, it was in an Indian residential school. My grandmother, my great grandmother, I was, and my little brother. And the thing is, we weren't allowed to practice our spirituality, our, our, who we are. We weren't allowed to speak our language. My grandmother, if she spoke her language in those Indian residential schools, they would take a nail and put it through her tongue and she would have to sit there throughout the day for speaking her language. Even me, as a little kid, and that was just not too long ago, because I was rebellious and I didn't listen, I was put through shock treatment therapy because I wouldn't listen to the colonizers. You know, they said, kill the Indi Indian, save the child. And that meant by any means possible. A lot of our little brothers and sisters were raped, were tortured, were, 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 um, they were put through some kind of uh, medical experiments, you know? And people wonder why we're so savagely. We are. We're Indian savages. Because that's what, that's what government creates. That's what corporation creates. This is why we are rising up as freedom fighters, as revolutionaries. Because if we don't continue, nations will die at the hands of corporate greed and power. You know, I just hope a lot of people, you know, understand when you sit here and you celebrate Canada Day, July 1st, you're celebrating the genocide of First Nation people. You are celebrating the rape of First Nation children. Sure. You are celebrating biological warfare sure. for corporation greed and power. We need to decolonize. We need to liberate not only these corporations, but us as a people. You know, a lot of people say that First Nation people get everything for free. So why do you see a lot of First Nation people homeless with mental health and addictions if we got everything for free? Heck, we pay rent on land that we were gifted to. And I welcome, and I will always walk with the Palestinians every single day.
through mind, body, soul, and spirit because they too are humans. They're human beings. And I hope you can all take this and remember when you go home, hug your children because there's a lot of Palestinian lives where they have to hug, the, hug a dead child. And that's not fair. And I'm sorry for bringing this, but it does need to be sp spoken about. People need to hear. People need to acknowledge. And people need to be accountable for the biological warfare, the genocidal massacres, for colonial violence in, through Canada, through Canada. You know what, before colonization was here, we were a good people. Before colonization was in Palestine, they were a good people. They're very kind, giving people. I was at the U of T in Kamen, and they treated us with love and kindness. And they accepted us for who we are. And we accept them for who, th who they are. You know, very gracious, powerful revolutionaries. Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! I thank you all for being here. You know, we were supposed to go to the water, but what matters is that we're here together in genuine solidarity. You know, as the people, people that want to live. You know, people don't think that there's an apartheid, a Canadian apartheid. Right now, there is murdered and missing indigenous women. Right now, our children are being taken. You know, um, our, our children are put into childcare services and from their human sex traffic. How I know is because I was one of them. I was one of them. I was human sex trafficked through, through, through those corporate entities. You know, but I made it out to tell my story. And people need to start speaking on their story. Waniska! That means wake up! It's time to stop walking so dead. Oh. No wonder we can get on in them well any chicken or have not been on can eat on a synonic. I was a shack. Hey, Jim, Jim, to join them in guitar. He knew how to stand in with to join them in guitar. My name is Mani Shikabe and I'm from Thunder Bay and I'm here to speak on behalf of the kids, the children. The ones you was talking about, I grew up. I didn't grow up in residential school. I grew up in a small community where I was treated like what the residential school was treated like. I didn't have a good life. My grandmother did raise me, but she couldn't protect me. She was too old. But the people in my own community, they did me wrong. And I forgave them and let them go because that's what we're supposed to do. That's what she told me. No matter what happens in your life, you have to love and forget. Not forget, but love and forgive, I mean. <laughs> Not forget, but forgive. Forgiveness, forgiveness is the most important thing to do in our lives. We are speaking for Palestinian people. We are speaking for Anishinaabe people who are still suffering today from alcoholism, drugs, you name it. We are all suffering. I was suffering for a long time when I was growing up in my childhood. I didn't have no um, education. I still don't have. I only went to school maybe one year. Grade four is where I ended up. And then I came out. And then I went to Sesame Street. That's where I learned my education. I don't know if anybody knows Sesame Street, but they're fighting and I'm still fighting. I will never stop fighting. And I, I'll probably stop when I'm gone up there somewhere in the spirit world. <laughs> but, uh, and I am also here for the youth, the young people. In Thunder Bay, I work with the young people and I lead them at nighttime how to love people. The ones that are homeless, the ones that are drunk, the ones that are out there who needs help. 
that the young people are learning how to love people and respect them. And that's my job, is to work with the young people to show them about love and respect for themselves. That's what I do. It doesn't matter how old you are when you're young. You're always interested in something. That's what happened to me. I said to myself when my grandmother left me, I said, how can you leave me? What am I supposed to do now that you're gone? But I just continued. And then here I am. I lived in a small community, really small. I had two kids from this man I married. That wasn't my choice. It was arranged marriage, it's called. Again, my family was running my life and they told me who I gotta marry and who I gotta be with. And that was not a nice thing to do because I suffered a great deal from this person I lived with. And the children and I ran away. Thank God we did because we probably, I probably wouldn't be here. And maybe they wouldn't even be here too. But that's how it was. I'm just telling you this so you know a little bit about me, why I'm fighting for the women, for the children, for the babies, for all of you people, for the old and the elderly. I fight for everyone and I will continue fighting and I will move my way to continue doing what I'm doing is helping people and just keep on traveling. And I encourage you native women here that are here, please write your stories. Don't leave it behind. Be remembered so they can know what happened to us and that they'll continue surviving. I'm a survivor of my community where I came from. I didn't go to big schools or anything like that, but here I am. Miigwech. Weweni. Nganna mechike. I'm going to say a prayer now for all of us. Manitou. Kika gwechme nungum. Chui jish nang weweni. Chipimbu duang bimatis winanan nungum gagishikak. We just nam we went to Jibu Musiang with my king. We just nam gay we went to Jisawene with the young Jisaki at the young we went. We just nam gay we went to Wab Mangich away, Nijan Suck, Awaja Shuck, Kakinagay going to be with Duang with my king. Great spirit, I ask you to guide us today what we have done and what we have said. Help us to grow with the kids and to watch these young people that are growing and the little children. Help us to help our own families and our friends and neighbors, help the women who are suffering, help the little babies, and help all the people that are suffering. Great Spirit, we ask your guidance today. Give us the strength to be where we are today. We thank you for all the love you give us so we can share it with other people. Thank you, miigwech. Métis stuff. My family is that Métis family that gets taught in Canadian history. Gabriel Dumont and Louis Riel both show up in my family tree. So I literally come from the last family to fight an armed resistance here on Turtle Island. And we're talking about truth and reconciliation. And you see Toronto, they have this 10 year plan but they've already gone off to a bad foot. So I'm gonna share with you a letter that I wrote. I wrote it two years ago, and when I first read it to a couple of my elder people I consider elders, I cried. Bear with me. This was written and dated for November the 16th of 2023, which is the anniversary of the hanging of Louis Riel. To Her Excellency, the Honorable Mary Simon, to the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, Her Honor, the Honorable Edith Dumont. To Dr. Colin Carey, MP of Oshawa. To the Honorable Wab Kinu, Premier of Manitoba. To Doug Ford, the MPP of Etobicoke North and the Premier of Ontario. To Sherry McLennan, the Director of Western Region 2, Métis Nation, Saskatchewan. To the Chief and Council of Beardies and Okamasis, 96 and 97, First Nation Treaty 6. To Olivia Chow, the Mayor of Toronto. The list goes on. There's many of them. Tanze Anibojo, Wachai, Sago, greetings. I'm writing to you today in the spirit of moving forward through truth and reconciliation. 
I've spearheaded a coalition of Métis citizens, First Nation band members, and local citizens of the GTA who have an interest in seeing forward movements toward a brighter future. The resonating theme with everyone is education. Many of us who descend from that historic nation and live in Ontario and even further east were given educations in a curriculum that deemed us as criminals and traitors before we were born. The timeline that I focus on is at the beginning of the Red River Resistance, and that's the formation of Manitoba. As a blossoming nation in 1869, being Canada, KK Canada, it was highly ambitious and looking forward to extend its reach into the Western Plains. As the Métis Nation defended its inherent land rights, there was an influx of settlers who began to take over the settlement, leading to an uprising by Louis David Riel. This period in the Métis history is known as the Reign of Terror. So when we talk about genocide, we know what that is too, because Canada terrorized us. Anyways, it resulted in Manitoba being formed. However, by the 1880s, the pressure from heavier European immigration saw the First Nations and the Métis leave the Red River settlement and headed west towards Saskatchewan on the St. Lo on the, on the Louis and, and Patoche. And these families, in the spring of 1882, would land on the South Saskatchewan and form St. Laurent de Grandin. For those of you who don't know, St. Laurent de Grandin is by Beardies and Oka Mesas, where a very infamous residential school was, St. Michael's. For a time, these towns flourished, and soon the inhabitants would take notice of the Orangemen from Ontario, who were slowly creeping on the lands again. The land at this point was called Assiniboia and was part of the Northwest Territories. On the modern map, that is the central and southern regions of Saskatchewan. That land doesn't exist by Canada's standards. I was born here, but my family's from Assiniboia, and I was told from a little boy you're Assiniboine, but it doesn't exist. We share with you a quote by John A. Macdonald in a collection called Louis the Heretic Poems. The impulsive half-breeds have got spoiled by this rioting and must be kept down by a strong hand until they are swamped by the influx of settlers. Right there is a quote from John A. Macdonald himself, the founding father of KKK Canada. I posed a question earlier, and here is the answer. After the events of Red River, Louis Riel fed to, fled to Montana where he lived in exile and became a naturalized citizen of the United States of America and worked as a school teacher. He had left his beloved homelands and remained in exile for several years until June of 1884. A delegation was sent from Saskatchewan to Montana on behalf of the Métis who settled at Batoche and the surrounding areas, asking Riel to return. He acceded to his people's request and a new provisional government was formed with Riel as the spiritual leader and the political leader. Ultimately, as fate would decide, Riel was tried and hung for treason in Regina, Saskatchewan on November the 16th, 1885. Shame. I propose that over the next several weeks, several months to a year, we discuss in the form of a committee task force, the historical events leading up to the return of Riel and the year leading up to the morning of March 26, 1885 at Duck Lake, Saskatchewan, and how to address the actions of the Queen's Own Rifles, the Grenadier Guards, and Orangemen Volunteers from Ontario. Men like Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Williams of Port Hope, a prominent businessman who begged for an opportunity to kill for his country. So John Tory, part of the Reconciliation Action Plan, apologized to the Métis in Ontario. But those wars didn't happen here. So to have a reconciliation action plan and that was your first thing to do out the gate was to apologize to the wrong people is already sending the wrong message. This is why we say we want reconciliation. So in response to the Truth and Reconcil Reconciliation Commission's calls to action 62, 63 and 93, there are 94 of them. We can't just pick and choose which ones to do. 
We invite you on a journey of reconciliation that would see a delegation travel to the Batash National Site to address those historical events and how to, how to lead and push forward in a change in education that would better show the past events. As the elected representatives of Toronto, Oshawa, Millbrook, Peterborough and Port Hope, it would be a monumental step forward to have you help forge the pathway. You see, we live in Upper Canada. That's what this place was called. And we all should be doing this. It shouldn't be a pick and choose thing. And I've seen a lot of new faces and a lot of new people that I've met over the last few months. And I'm standing here telling Palestinian people, I know exactly what you guys are feeling, a fake state coming in and taking everything from you and obliterating you. We went through it. So I stand in solidarity with you guys as well. Free, free, free Palestine! Free, free, free Palestine! Here and disperse. Thank you all for coming. Oh, hang on, hang on. I was wrong. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Coco. Um, I wrote a speech last year on Thanksgiving in solidarity with the Palestinians. And today, after the police told us we couldn't do our ceremony at the water because they stood with us, um, <clears throat> I decided I'll uh, do the speech again. <laughs> I come from a land back family, a family of mixed indigenous blood on both sides. I had family members in the rice wars in Oka, organizing a field takeover of Algonquin Park and many other ancestral places. I protested, organized, and took up arms Sorry. and passed on these, this responsibility to the next generation, carrying it forward for land back, rail blockades and language revitalization. My father is Algonquin. Our lands are north and east of here. They are unceded and occupied. The parliament buildings of so-called Canada sit on unceded Algonquin lands. The rural side of my dad's family was pushed out of Algonquin Park just a few generations ago so settler colonizers could feed wild animals and go camping. So settler companies could log the woods and mine the mineral rich lands. The rural side clung to, to traditions with few letting go every generation. This is future without decolonization. The urban side of my dad's family has lived in the same neighborhood outside the mission north of North Street in the city I grew up in for over 300 years. For over 300 years, colonialism has reduced large portions of the descendants of my warrior family to eat in the same church run mission soup kitchen, but if you always walked to the island and prayed for the warrior spirit to return. This is the future without decolonization. And when I see Palestinians rise up against military, military settler occupation by any means necessary, I see my ancestors from before the soup kitchens who died hoping to give freedom to the future generations against a war machine they couldn't imagine. I see the giants I called aunties and uncles and elders willing to fight with whatever they could scrapped together, praying that one day there would be freedom. When I see the f sacrifice the Palestinian warriors give of their soul that, so that their future babies may know freedom, I see the greatest love that has ever been known. When I see people call freedom fighters terrorists, I know this word has been applied <coughs> to more than one member of my family by the settler state. When I see the colonial world condemn freedom fighters, I see three th 300 years of my family's children squashed by of spirit in the same generational soup kitchen and the same ramfested social housing I grew up in. And I know that all my ancestors stand with all your answers and beg us to stand for truth and freedom at any cost. Woo!